Hydrogen Collider infrastructure talk. Uh, you probably know the Large Hydrogen Collider um, over at CERN. Uh, we heard quite a big, bit of it uh, in the recent talks. This time, we will have a deep dive into, into the infrastructure. Um, you can assume over the next speakers are um, doing a great job. Basically, um, it's pretty obvious because we're not stuck into a, uh, into a giant supermassive black hole. So um, please welcome, with a very warm applause, Severin and Stefan. Thanks. 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 Yeah, hello everyone. Um, thanks for coming, so many people here, quite nice. Um, in the last couple of years we had several talks about uh, yeah, basically the physics perspective of LHC. Um, how physicists analyze data at LHC, how physicists uh, store all the data, etc. And we would like to give like more an engineering perspective of the whole LHC. So three years ago we had a talk by Axel about how physicists analyze massive big data. And then last year we had a talk conquering large numbers at LHC by Carsten and Stephanie. And uh, we would, as I mentioned already, we would like make to give like more an engineering perspective. Um, we are Stefan and Severin. We are both electrical engineers working at CERN. Stefan is working in the e experimental physics microelectronics section. And he will give a second talk tomorrow about designing high reliability digital electronics together with Shimon uh, tomorrow morning at 11.30. And I'm, as I mentioned already, also working at CERN. I'm working in the electronics for machine protection section. I will describe briefly later. A short disclaimer, um, the LHC is a pretty big machine and uh, we try to explain it as good as possible. 45 minutes is not really enough to talk about everything because I think you can basically take one of the topics we are talking here about now and uh, talk for 45 minutes only about one specific topic but we try to give an overview as good as possible. So imagine you want to build an accelerator in your backyard. Okay, maybe not in your backyard because LHC is quite big, so 27 kilometers uh, in diameter is quite big. Um, but basically we figured out three main challenges you have to take. First of all, we have to accelerate particles because otherwise it's not a particle accelerator. Um, second, we have to keep the particles on a circular trajectory. And then third, we have to make sure that the particles which are inside our beam tube or beam pipe uh, don't collide with anything which is there. For example, the beam pipe itself, air molecules, etc. And the solution we adopted for LHC there is that we accelerate the particles with a high power radio frequency cavities. Then we have a beam control system which is quite sophisticated uh, using superconducting magnets. And then we have the beam pipe itself, which is evacuated, uh, so it's under vacuum conditions, to write any collisions we have inside uh, with gas molecules, etc. A brief overview about the location itself. So um, probably many of you know already that CERN is uh, next to Geneva. So it's in the western southern part of Switzerland. When we zoom in a little bit more, then we have here an artificial like picture of LHC itself in the red circle there. Um, to put it a little bit in a perspective, we have uh, a relatively big airport there. You can see there it's a 2,200 meter long runway. Um, we have Geneva Lake next to it, and that's only one small part of, LH uh, of Geneva Lake, but nevertheless. And what is also quite nice, we see Mont Blanc from, uh, LHC, uh, from, from, from CERN. When we zoom in a little bit more, then we basically have the big uh, circular collider there, that's LHC itself, and we have pre-accelerators I will talk in a few minutes about. Basically, we have two main campuses. We have the Miron site, which is in Switzerland, and we have the Prifson site, which is in France. Then at LHC itself, we have eight service points. We also call this just points. Um, to briefly go through all of them, we have point one, where we have um, the ex experiment called ATLAS, um, one of the big and major experiments at LHC. Then at the exactly opposite side of L ATLAS, we have CMS at point five. Then we have a little bit smaller experiment, which is Alice. It was basically constructed for lead ion runs. We will talk about this later. And then we have another relatively small experiment. It's called LHCB, and that's the only non-symmetrical experiment at LHC. These are, I think, the four experiments you already maybe heard of. Then there are four or three other small experiments. We have LHCF at point one. It's a forward scattering experiment at point one. So basically they are taking data like uh, scattered particles from uh, uh, ATLAS itself. Then we have TOTEM. Uh, it's also a forward scattering experiment at point five. Then we have 
um, sorry, we have Mödal, which is the experiment at point eight. They are looking for magnetic monopoles. Um, then we have Totem, uh, sorry for that, um, at point five. And then we have a relatively new experiment, which is called Phaser. It's actually under construction and it will be used uh, starting from 2021. And it's a forward scattering experiment, which uh, where they try to detect neutrinos. Then we have point four. Uh, there we have the RF cavities to accelerate the particle beam itself. We have the beam, beam dump area. So when there is like uh, a fault in a machine or we just want to dump the beam, then we use the beam dump system at point six. And then we have uh, two more general service areas. It's uh, point three and point seven. LHC would not be possible without the pre-accelerator complex, so we have uh, a relatively big one, and it's also, also sometimes relatively old. Um, on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see LINAC2. It's uh, an old uh, linear accelerator, which was used until last year. Uh, it's now, now phased out, and now we have LINAC4, which is also a, a linear accelerator, and it has a little bit higher uh, acceleration. Then we have uh, the proton synchrotron booster. Um, it's the first circular collider. So um, you can see two pictures there. What is relatively special about uh, PSP is that we have there two, uh, sorry, uh, four beam pipes instead of just one beam pipe. Then we have the proton synchrotron accelerator, which is the next stage, uh, stage for acceleration. It then has only one, one beam pipe. And then we are going from PS, we are going to SPS, which is the proton uh, super proton synchrotron. Um, which is has uh, 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 circumferences of seven kilometers. There we basically accelerate the particles the last time, and then they're injected in LHC itself. Um, we mentioned a few uh, accelerators already, um, basically all everything which is highlighted here, but uh, CERN is a little bit more, so CERN is famous for LHC, I would say, but there is much more than only LHC, so only around 15% of the protons which are accelerated in a pre-accelerator complex are really going to the um, LHC itself. So there's much more, there's uh, material science, um, there's antimatter uh, research and all different other kinds of research going on. Of course, everything has to be controlled. It's called uh, CCC, the CERN Control Center. It's uh, located at uh, the Prefson site uh, looks like that. So basically, we have uh, four C's uh, looking to each other, and there the operators are sitting 24-7 and operate the whole machine. So basically, the whole pre-accelerator pre complex, all the energy, cryogenics, and LHC itself. Before you ask, everything is running on scientific Linux, so we have basically our own uh, Linux distribu distribution, which is used there, and it, of course, it's open source. Talking about the LHC beam itself, um, we have two beams. One is running clockwise and the other one is running anti-clockwise because we don't have a fixed target experiment where we basically let the, pro the accelerated particles uh, colliding with uh, like a fixed target, like metal or something like that. Um, we have control collisions at four points, we mentioned before. Um, most of the year we have uh, proton run, uh, proton uh, run, so uh, we have protons and protons colliding each, uh, towards each other. And then we have at the end of the year, nearly starting from November to December, we have a lead iron run. The proton itself, it's not really like a fixed uh, straight line of particles. We have uh, something called bunches. You can imagine a bunch a little bit like um, a spaghetti. It's basically has the same length of a spaghetti, but it has, it's much thinner than a spaghetti. And uh, each bunch, when you have a proton run, then each bun bunch consists of approximately 100 billion protons. And when you have lead iron run, then we have approximately 10 million lead irons in LHC. And last year, we operated with 2,565 bunches in the LHC itself. The LHC tunnel. Um, we already talked about the tunnel itself. It is uh, 27 kilometers long. And you can see maybe a little bit on this graph that we have some, we have eight straight sections and we have eight arcs in the tunnel. Um, basically, the straight sections are always there where we have like service cavities or where we have service areas and also the experiments. Um, because it's not so good visible in this picture, I put a picture here. Um, basically, that's a straight section of LHC. You can basically just see the beam pipe itself with aluminum foil around it. Um, there are also no magnets. And when we look in the arc section of LHC, then we, you see here the arc itself. And I think it's quite famous picture of LHC itself uh, because we have this blue dipole magnets there. The tunnel itself is um, an old tunnel used previously by LEP, the Large Electron Proton Collider. It has a diameter of 3.8 meters, and the circumference, circumference is approximately 27 kilometers. 
inside the tunnel we have first of all cryogenics so we have big tubes uh, stainless steel tubes to uh, carry all the cryogenics so liquid uh, helium and uh, gaseous helium then we have the magnet itself to bend the particles and then we have electrical insula uh, installations to carry like signals from the magnets to uh, have uh, safety systems electricity etc etc Geography is a little bit complicated in the area because we have in the western part of LHC we have the Jura mountain range and uh, this Jura mountain range has a relatively hard material it's uh, made out of uh, not made but nature I mean it's a uh, limestone so it's relatively complicated to dig into this material in comparison to all the other areas at LHC so when you would basically put a straight section of LHC then you have to dig much more in the uh, relatively hard limestone. So that's why it was decided that uh, the lab or LHC tunnel is tilted a little bit. So we have a tilt angel of 1.4% there. The depth is approximately between 50 meters at uh, 0.1 or 0.8 uh, up to 170 meters deep uh, at 0.4. We already talked a little bit about magnets, but we would like to go a little bit more in the details now. So why do we need magnets? Um, Maybe you learned at school that when you have a magnetic field and you have charged particles, then you can bend particles around uh, an arc in a magnetic field. Depending on the charge of the particles, you bend them around on the right side or the left si uh, side. That's this famous uh, right hand and left side rule you maybe learned during school. And at LHC, we cannot use uh, normal magnets like uh, typical uh, magnets. We have to use electromagnets because normal magnets would not be strong enough to uh, build an electromagnetic field which is feasible to bend the particles around um, the whole tunnel. At LHC we use in the dipole magnets a magnetic field of 8.3 Tesla and to do this we need a current of 11,850 amps. We have basically two different types of magnets. We have bending magnets, so the dipole magnets I mentioned quite often already. And then we have injection and extraction magnets. They are also dipole magnets, there, but they are a little bit differently constructed because the ex injection and extraction magnets have to be quite fast because they have to uh, basically be powered up at full uh, with the full magnetic field in several microseconds. Then we have um, higher order magnets, which are quadrupole magnets, sectopole magnets, and octopole magnets, etc., etc., um, and they are used for focusing and defocusing the beam itself. In total, we have 1,200 uh, dipole magnets in LHC. We have around 850 quadrupole magnets, and we have 4,800 uh, higher order magnets, but they are normally quite short, so shorter than the, the other magnets. The dipole magnets consist of uh, two apertures. Um, they are used to bend the beam around, so I already said. Um, in the middle of the uh, magnet itself, we have a cold bore, so there's basically there are the particles flying around. Um, then there's a metallic structure, you can see this in the picture, there's this uh, shiny metallic uh, sphere you see there. And then we have, next to the cold bore, we have uh, the, tool, the two apertures uh, to bend the particle and build the uh, magnetic field itself. The dipole magnets have a length of 50 meters and the manufacturing precision is plus minus 1.5 uh, millimeters. Then we have quadrupole magnets. Uh, they are used for focusing and defocusing the beam. The problem is that we have um, bunches where are basically basically e equally charged particles inside, and uh, the Coulomb force tells us that when we have like equally charged particles, then they are basically want to uh, fade out from each other, and in the end they would just hit the beam pipe itself, and we could maybe destroy the beam or cannot do any collisions. So what we do is we use uh, quadrupole magnets uh, as yeah similar to lenses because we can focus and defocus the beam. Um, the quadrupole magnets, m the name already suggested it, that we have basically four apertures. So we have uh, on the left and the right side two, and then we have on top and bottom, we have also a few of them. Um, to go a little bit into detail about the focusing and defocusing scheme. In the beginning, we have a particle beam which is not focused, but we want to focus it. Then we go to uh, the first quadrupole magnet, so we focus the beam. Um, and this is only done in one axis, that's a little bit of a problem. So in the second axis, we don't have any focusing, we have a defocusing effect there. And then we have to use a second quadrupole magnet for the other axis, in this case the Y axis, to focus the beam even further. And you can even see this here in the Z axis, that's basically the 
the cut of the beam itself, you can also see that in the beginning we have on the left side, we have a non-focused beam and then we focus it in one axis so we have like a little bit more ellipse and then we focus in the other direction and we have a different ellipse. So we have to use uh, several quadrupole magnets in a row to really focus the beam in the way we want to have it. In the LFC magnets, we have quite high currents. Um, we, use, we, we need these currents uh, because otherwise we cannot uh, bend the very high energetic uh, particle beam. And, and to use normal conducting cable, it would not be possible to basically build a magnet out of it. So what we do is we use materials which are called superconducting ma uh, materials uh, because they have a very good effect. They uh, go to basically zero uh, resistance at a specific temperature point. And uh, after this point, or when we basically go lower, lower then we have uh, the current can flow without any losses inside of it. But to reach the state, we have to cool down the magnets quite heavily, which is not so easy, but it can be done. And um, on the right side, you basically see a very historic plot that was uh, 1911 in Denmark. A researcher called Heike Onnes uh, uh, detected for the first time a superconducting effect in mercury and it was detected at 4.19 Kelvin. To show you a little bit the comparison between a normal conducting cable and the superconducting cable as we uh, put a picture here. So that is basically the same amount of cable you need to use to carry uh, 13,000 amps and uh, to do the same or to transport the same amount of energy we also can use a very small superconducting cable and I think it's quite obvious why we use here superconducting cables. At LHC we use niobium tin as material and uh, this material basically goes into superconducting state as at 10 Kelvin but to have a safe operation doing LHC we have to cool it down at 1.9 Kelvin. Superconducting magnets have uh, some benefits, but also some downsides. So sometimes they change their state because there are small vib vibrations in the magnet or the temperature is not uh, pr precise enough or the current is too high. Then they change that uh, state and it's called quench. And uh, we basically can detect a quench when we measure the voltage across the magnet because the resistance changes at this point. So when there is a quench, then the resistance changes quite rapidly in milliseconds and we can detect this voltage rise uh, with uh, sophisticated electronics. On the right side, you see a board I'm working on. So basically here, we have a measuring, measuring system to measure the voltages across the magnet. And then we have a detection logic implemented in FPGA um, to uh, basically send triggers out and open an interlock loop. Interlock loop is a system at LHC. You can imagine it a little bit like a cable going around the whole tunnel. And there are thousands of switches around this uh, interlock loop. And as soon as one of the detection system basically opens the, the, um, the interlock loop, then basically the whole machine will be switched off. And what means switch off is basically that we will power down the power converter, but then the energy is still in the superconducting magnet. And it has to be taken out of the superconducting magnet. Uh, and therefore, we use dump resistors to extract the energy. And you here you can see uh, a picture of such a dump resistor. It's uh, quite big. It's in a stainless steel tube, oil cooled. Um, it's approximately three or four meters long and uh, when basically there was a quench and the energy was uh, is extracted by these resistors then uh, the whole resistor is heated up by several hundred degrees and it needs several hours to cool it down again. Power converters. The power converters are used to um, power the magnet itself so they can produce a current of approximately 13,000 amps and a voltage of plus minus 190 volts and you can see a picture how here how big it is. Um, one downside with uh, the power converters is that they have to be, not downside, but one uh, difficulty is that they have to be very precise uh, because every instability in the current would have or has a direct effect on the beam stability itself. So basically the beam would be not diverted in the right uh, amount of um, length. So that's why they have to be very precise and have to have a very precise stability. So here I just pointed out like in 24 hours uh, the power converter is only allowed to have a deviation of 5 ppm and in comparison for 13,000 amps we have a deviation of 65 milliamps um, so the power converters have to be very precise and to do that we had to develop our own ADC because at the time when LHC was built there was no ADC on the market uh, which was able to have this precision and also the whole ADC is put into uh, super precise temperature controlled areas and uh, it is calibrated quite regularly. Okay, cryogenics. Um, we already talked about that we have superconducting magnets and they have to be cooled down quite uh, low. 
So the superconducting magnets we have at LHC has to have to be cooled down to 1.9 Kelvin. And uh, we are doing this when we like start the LHC, then we cool down in the first hand with li liquid nitrogen. So approximately 6,000 tons of liquid nitrogen are put uh, through the magnets to cool them down to 18 Kelvin. And afterwards we cool uh, the magnets down with uh, liquid helium. Um, and the liquid helium is at 1.9 or 1.8 Kelvin. And to put it a little bit in a comparison, outer space, so when we measure like the temperature of space, we have approximately 2.7 Kelvin in outer space. So LHC is much colder than outer space. The whole cooldown needs approximately one month, and uh, each dipole magnet, which is 50 meter long, uh, shrinks several centimeters during that, which also has to be taken into account because otherwise uh, pipes would break. The cryogenic system is that we have at each um, of the eight points at LHC, we have uh, compressors to uh, cool down uh, the liquid helium or the helium itself. And then we compress uh, the helium uh, and pump it down. We have one gaseous helium stream, which is at 15 Kelvin, and we have one liquid helium stream at approximately 4.5 Kelvin. And then we pump it underground. And then we have something called cold compression system. And the cold compression system even further uh, reduces the, um, the pressure of the helium that we have in the end uh, a helium which is at 1.8 Kelvin, so it can really cool down the magnet itself. And uh, helium has a very interesting effect because at 2.1 Kelvin it becomes something called superfluid, so it basically can um, run around uh, like holes, for example, or walls. It can basically flow. Um, against gravity, which is quite interesting. And it has also very high thermal conductivity, and that's also why we use uh, superfluid helium here. And that's why we cool down the whole uh, magnets that low. And uh, one other interesting effect is also that the LHC tilt angel, which is 1.4%, uh, has to be taken into account because we have very low pressure inside all the tubes or all the system. So it's at 60 millibars, but we have sometimes to pump the helium uh, against gravity or uh, going down. So we also have to take into account the LHC tilt angel to not have like uh, wrong pressure levels uh, at the whole LHC itself. <laughs> okay. All right. So you probably already got the idea that, um, that what we've done in the last 20 minutes was only solve the first of the three challenges we had, which was actually bending the beam around the circular tra trajectory. Uh, so I'm trying to go, trying to, go to the other uh, challenges we have lined, uh, lined up in the beginning. And the first one of that is the actual acceleration um, of the particle beam. And as um, large synchrotrons, for example, like the LHC, they use uh, radio frequency or RF systems to do uh, this acceleration. And I'm just going to go uh, do a quick recap of the LHC beam uh, and RF and how they interact. So Severin mentioned already that the particles in LHC actually come in bunches, um, so in like packets that contain uh, about 100 billion protons. And those bunches are spaced when they are running around the LHC approximately 25 nanoseconds apart. And uh, starting from that, um, the tasks of the RF system are basically twofold. It first has to ensure that these bunches are kept tightly together in a process that we call longitudinal focusing. And the second task is to care for the actual acceleration of the particle bunches. Uh, so from their injection energy, when they come from one of the pre-accelerators, uh, up to their uh, final energy that they are supposed to collide at during uh, the physics run. Um, so in general, you can imagine RF as being a quickly alternating uh, electric and uh, magnetic field components. Um, and in the LHC, this uh, RF um, energy is basically injected into a what is called a cavity, which is a resonant structure. Um, and there the particle beams uh, traverse through while the field uh, quickly alternates. Um, and the uh, RF um, signal or the energy basically interacts with the particle beam. Um, so perhaps you know that the uh, protons are positively charged um, and then a negative um, polarity of the field would attract these protons while a positive uh, field uh, location would basically uh, move them away. And this has, uh, when, well, after just injecting and with the frequency of this RF field being the same as the speed that the particles actually go around the LHC, um, solves the first of the two problems, which was the, the focusing, uh, because actually the particles that are too slow uh, arrive only when the field is already changed to the opposite polarity and actually get accelerated a bit, while the particles that are too fast, they are actually being uh, decelerated a bit, and uh, this is a process that we call the, the longitudinal focusing, uh, which makes sure that the bunches stay neatly packed together. Um, and of course, this would be relatively inefficient if we would only change the polarity of this field once 
uh, for each of the, pro uh, the proton bunches that pass by, which is why we uh, do it 10 times. So we change the polarity basically changes 10 times, or the frequency is 10 times higher than the, the bunch crossing frequency. Uh, and by doing that, we make sure that the, uh, the change of this field is uh, much uh, faster, and therefore the particle bunches are uh, packed much closer together, and the focusing is better. Um, so here you can see these cavities that were shown in the previous picture as a schematic, how they are actually placed in the tunnel. So, um, so eight of these uh, huge cavities are used per beam, and they are the actual thing that is used to couple the RF uh, energy into the, uh, into the beam and transfer it to the particles. Um, they are also operating superconductively, so at cryogenic temperatures, uh, to reduce the, the thermal stress and the losses that would otherwise occur in their materials. Um, and these are actually, even though they are so big, similar to the magnets that had to be very precisely uh, manufactured, these also have very, uh, very small manufacturing tolerances and have to be precisely tuned uh, to the RF frequency that is used um, to inject. So, and the second part of this uh, that actually produces this high-power RF signal uh, for that is used what we call klystrons. So klystrons are basically RF amplifiers. They are uh, built from high-power RF uh, vacuum tubes, um, and they pr um, amplify this 400 megahertz signal that is used to transfer energy um, to the particles. Um, and each of those klystrons produces about 300 kilowatts of power, and you can probably imagine how much that uh, power for an individual unit that is, if you know that your microwave oven has like two or three kilowatts. Um, and of course, as we have eight cavities per beam and one klystron always feeds one cavity, we in total have 16 of those klystrons and they are in principle able to uh, deliver a total energy of 4.8 megawatts into uh, the LHC beam to accelerate it. Um, but if we take a small step back, for now we have only solved the first of the two problems, which was to keep the, uh, the bunches ne neatly focused, because currently the, um, the particles have been injected and the frequency is at some uh, specific frequency, and actually they are only running basically in sync, the two. Uh, so what we do after all the, the particle bunches from the pre-accelerators have been injected into LHC is that we ever so slightly increase the frequency, which of course also means that the particles need to accelerate together uh, with the RF signal, um, and this is the mechanism that we use to accelerate them, actually. Um, and the change that is required to do this is very tiny, actually. So it is less than a thousandth of a percent, sometimes, um, that is used to change the frequency to actually make them go so much faster. So from their relatively low injection energy, energy up to the top energy uh, plateau that they need to have to uh, produce the actual physics collisions. Um, and an interesting question to ask here is where does this signal actually come from? If it needs to be so precisely tuned to some sp uh, specific frequency, um, who generates it or who controls it? Um, and that is, opens up the whole complex of the, the timing of the, of the LHC of the machine. Um, so actually, this first signal that I mentioned, this RF signal, it originates in a um, Faraday cage, so in a specially shielded area, uh, somewhere on the Prefson side of CERN. Um, and then from there, it is um, uh, distributed to the, to the low-level RF subs uh, subsystem with the um, uh, klystrons and the cavities. Um, but in this, inside this room, there are also a number of other signals generated. Um, the first one of that being this bunch crossing clock, which is the actual clock that uh, signals one pulse basically every time or changes polarity. One time a proton bunch uh, moves across a specific location inside the LHC. And another one uh, is the so-called orbit clock, which always indicates the start of the first or when one um, par uh, proton bunch has basically re-arrived at the same position and has completed one orbit. Um, and you may ask the question why this is an important piece of information, um, but if you think back to this um, uh, image that Severin has already shown about the accelerator complex, uh, the, the, the big challenge that all this brings is also the uh, whole synchronization of all these machines. Because you have to imagine that while these proton bunches run around uh, the LHC and new ones are supposed to be injected from the outside, from another pre-accelerator, uh, this has to be very precisely synchronized. So all these pre-accelerator systems actually share a common synchronized timing system that allows them to precisely inject a new packet of, of bunches uh, at the right position, at the right location into the LHC. Um, and this is a bit how such a timing distribution system looks like. It is uh, only a very small excerpt of what it looks like, but it, it gives you an idea that somewhere underground uh, in the LHC, there is rooms full of equipment that is just used to distribute timing signals between different parts of the accelerator. 
Um, and of course, um, as, as CERN is forward thinking and uh, realized that uh, future colliders will uh, need quite a bit more of all this synchronization uh, and that the requirements for how precisely everything needs to be synchronized is, uh, is ever growing, they actually developed their own timing distribution standard, uh, which is also uh, openly available and um, available for everybody to use. Uh, so if you're interested, look that up. Um, but of course, not only the, um, experiment, uh, the accelerator itself is interested in this information, um, about what particles are where and uh, how, how quickly they interact or how, how quickly they go around. But also all the experiments need this information because in the end um, they want to know, okay, has, has an, a collision occurred at some specific time in my experiment? And actually providing this timing information about uh, when, when bunches have crossed their uh, experiment locations is also vital for them to really time tag all their collision data and basically track which bunches were um, responsible for what, what, what kind of event or uh, what event throughout their whole signal uh, storage and processing chain, let's say. Good, so that is basically challenge two out of the way. So that was the acceleration of the actual particles and all the associated issues with timing. And the, first issue, uh, the third issue we mentioned was that um, the particles need to, let's say, be kept from colliding with anything but themselves or the other beam. Um, and that is what we, why we need vacuum systems for. So, again, it is not as simple as just putting a vacuum somewhere. Of course not, um, because in fact there is not only one vacuum system at LHC, but there are three. So the first two of those are perhaps a bit less interesting to, to most of us. Um, they are ma mainly insulation vacuum systems that are used for the cryogenic magnets. Um, so they isolate, uh, basically thermally isolate the um, uh, magnets at those very cool temperatures uh, from the surrounding air to avoid them uh, getting more uh, heat load than they need to. And there is an insulation vacuum also for the helium distribution lines that are actually distributing, uh, delivering the helium to these magnets. And then the third one, which is perhaps the most interesting one, is the beam vacuum. So the one where actually the beam circulates inside um, the LHC. And uh, this is a cross-section of what this beam vacuum typically looks like. Um, so it is approximately this size, so very, uh, uh, very hand, handful, let's say. Um, and uh, the question you may ask, okay, if I want to keep all the, like, the particles in my uh, particle beam from colliding with anything they're not supposed to, for example, rest molecules in, of remaining air there, how many uh, molecules can there still be? So somebody has to make up that number. Um, and typically you express this as a, a quantity called the beam lifetime, um, which basically says if you were only to keep those particles um, circulating in the accelerator, how long would it take uh, until they are, if have all dispersed and lost their energy due to colliding with uh, rest gas molecules? Um, and it was decided that this should be at a, a value of 100 hours, is what the, the beam should basically be able to, to circulate without collisions, without being lost. Um, and this gave the requirement for pressures down to about 100 femtobar, uh, which is a very small, very, very tiny fraction of the atmospheric pressure we have here, which is about one bar. Um, and to actually get to this level of vacuum, it, of, it requires multiple stages and multiple components to actually get there. Mm. So the initial vacuum inside these beam tubes, which, is, which are basically going, uh, throughout the, or going throughout the whole LHC tunnel, um, has the volume of approximately the Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, so the first step of getting all, this, the, all the air out of these uh, beam tubes is using turbomolecular pumps. Um, and then um, there's some, there needs to be more mechanisms to reduce the pressure even further because these pumps are not able to reduce the pressure to the levels required. Um, and they actually use a relatively clever trick um, to do that, which is the use of cryopumping. Um, so the... I cannot show that. Okay, so the uh, outer wall of this beam pipe cross-section that you see here is actually also where the um, very cold helium in the, inside the magnets is, is outside of. Um, and what that, that does is uh, it leads to an effect called cryopumping. So actually any uh, rest gas molecule that hits this wall actually condenses there. Um, and as the molecules condense there, they are of course removed from the atmosphere inside this beam pipe, which removes them from the atmosphere and increases the quality of the vacuum. Um, and with the use of this, and in the warm sections, the use of getter coatings, which are basically able to trap gas molecules, uh, you are able to reach the uh, crazy vacuum levels that are required uh, to make this happen. 
But uh, they realized also during the design that one big problem uh, for the first time in an ex accelerator, um, another effect will create a significant problem for the vacuum, uh, which is the generation of synchrotron radiation. Um, so synchrotron radiation is a byproduct of when you do bend a particle beam, um, what is, it results in a phenomenon called synchrotron radiation. And when this synchrotron radiation, as it goes straight on and is not bent, uh, hits the walls of this vacuum system, or in this, pipe, uh, in this case of the beam pipe, it actually liberates um, molecules from there and reintroduces them into the vacuum, which of course then makes the vacuum worse again. Uh, so they, um, an, an, an additional problem that, that gives the synchrotron radiation is that it also gives a significant heat load. And if you need to uh, dissipate all this heat that is generated through, through the, the very cold helium, uh, this is not a very efficient process because making this helium so cool uh, is actually a very energy intensive process. And just removing a single watt of thermal power uh, through the superfluid helium costs about one kilowatt of energy. So that is not the most efficient part. And this is why the cross section you have just seen includes another uh, large component, which also technically belongs to the vacuum system, which is called the beam screen. And this beam screen is basically another tube running inside the beam pipe. Um, of, of which we have, of course, two, uh, which runs inside the magnet cold bores, and it shields the synchrotron radiation heat load from the outer walls, which are at 1.8 Kelvin, um, while this pipe itself is actively cold to only about 20 ke uh, Kelvin of, of temperature, which is much more efficient to dissipate this heat. Um, so it is basically a steel tube about one millimeter thick. Um, it has these pumping holes where uh, like hydrogen gas uh, molecules can, can go out of, um, and it, on the inside, it has a, cup, a copper coating, which is used to reduce its uh, electrical uh, resistance, which is required because the beam, while it circulates, also induces current that would otherwise flow inside this uh, tube, which is really, and if you think about it, only a simple tube, and it would increase the heat load again. So the, a lot of engineering already has to go into a very simple piece of a thing like that. Um, so... The, after having speak, uh, spoken so much about all the, the things required to just make a beam circulate and accelerate and so on, uh, now it's probably also time to talk a little bit about the beam itself and how to control it and how to, how to instrument, how to measure things about this, um, this beam, even without going yet about uh, collisions and doing actual physics experiments. So the first important bit that is able to basically control or, or uh, influence the beam here uh, is what's called the beam cleaning or collimation system. So typically such a particle beam is not, uh, not uh, very clean. It always travels with associated with it what is called halo of particles around this core area that is less than a millimeter wide where most of the intensity is focused. Um, and these particles outside we want to remove um, because they otherwise would be lost uh, inside the magnets and, for example, would lead to, to quenches of the superconducting magnets. Um, and for collimation, uh, we basically use small slits that are adjustable and are located at two main locations of the LHC. So they have collimation systems there uh, with vertical and horizontal slits that can be adjusted in width uh, um, to or in order to scrape off all the particles that that they do want to get rid of and extract out of the beam, while only the core part can circulate and produce clean uh, collisions without any background uh, that otherwise would need to be accounted for. And then there is a whole other open topic of beam instrumentation. So when you run a particle accelerator, you want to measure various quantities and uh, performance figures of such a beam. Uh, and it is crucial for correct operation and for the highest performance, um, getting the highest performance from an accelerator. And there are a lot of different types of those, and I want to go quickly about uh, over why we have them and what we, would, what we do with them. So the first and most basic measurement we want, you want to do is the beam current measurement. So the beam current is a, a basic accelerator beam intensity measurement. So it gives you enough, an idea of how strong the beam that is running inside your accelerator is, and it is measured using these DCCTs, or DC current transformers. Um, and their basic principle of operation is that uh, while, they, uh, while the particles move through this torus, which is actually a coil or a transformer, uh, it uses a voltage there that you can measure and then use to quantify the intensity of this beam. And the big challenge here is that the dynamic range uh, this instrument needs to capture is re really large because it has to operate from the lowest intensity um, pilot injection beams up to the full energy, full uh, number of bunches uh, running inside the LHC. So it has to cover six orders of magnitude of measurement um, dynamic range. Then the second thing when talking about 
um, collisions is the luminosity measurement. So luminosity is a quantity basically said to measure the rate of interaction of the particle beams. Um, so to, to give you an idea of how often uh, interactions happen inside the experiments or where you want them to happen. And this measurement is used to, first of all, adjust th this interaction rate to a target value, which is optimal for the experiments to function, and to equalize the interaction rates in different experiments. So different uh, experiments also are specified to have the same interaction rate, so they can get the same, um, let's say, statistical quality of their data. So it's used to equalize those. And uh, then as a third thing, this um, system is also used to measure the crossing angle of the beams. So as you may know, at some points when the beams are collided, they collide at an angle um, that is very small. And this angle is actually measured also very precisely um, in order to adjust uh, it correctly. And it is measured to less than a thousandth of a degree, which is, again, a very impressive feat, given that the detection principle of this measurement is only measurement of some neutral particles that are a result of the particle interaction of the beam of the collision. OK, so that is number two. Um, then number three that we have is the beam position monitor, because along the LHC, um, you also always want to know uh, where the beam is at any given time. So you want to measure the, the position of the beam in the, inside the beam pipe in order to optimally uh, adjust it to the position you want to have it. Um, and for that, we use these beam position monitors, of which we have more than 1,000 installed along the LHC. So they are typically capacitive probes or electromagnetic strip lines, as you can see on top and bottom, respectively. Um, and they basically um, are distributed along the LHC and provide position of the particle beam along the accelerator, which can then be used to tune, for example, the magnets. All right, um, then we have beam profile. So after the position, uh, that gives you an idea where the beam is. You also want to know the, its intensity distribution. Um, basically, when you do a, would do a cut through the, uh, the beam pipe somewhere, you want to know how the intensity profile looks like. And for that, um, we have basically two measurement systems. One measures the profile in x and y directions. So if you really would do a cut, and it gives you something like this. And it's, for example, done with wire scanners, which is literal, very thin wire that is moved uh, through the beam. And then the, the current that the, the beam moving through this wire uh, generates is used to generate such a profile map. Uh, when scanning with this wire. Um, and the other one is the longitudinal profile, uh, which gives you an idea about the quality of your RF system. Um, and there you want to know how the intensity profile of your beam looks like if you were looking only at one spot of the accelerator and the beam would pass by, and you would basically see over time how the, the intensity looks like. And then as the last bit of uh, beam instrumentation, there is the beam loss monitors. So they are these yellow tubes that are uh, located on the outside of um, mostly all the, the magnets, of, of the uh, dipole and quadrupole magnets and so on. Um, again, there's more than a 1,000 of those. And the idea here is that uh, you need a lot of detectors um, that are basically small ionization chambers, which detect any showers of secondary particles that are generated when one of the high energy protons uh, are lost somewhere in the magnet materials. Um, so these are really used for protection of the system because if a, a specific threshold of, of energy losses is detected, then the accelerator needs to be quickly shut down, which is why they have to reject, uh, react in a matter of nanoseconds um, in order to uh, keep the, the uh, accelerator safe because any interaction of the particle beam with, for example, the magnets could just destroy huge amounts of, of money and of time that wouldn't be need to rebuild. And uh, as a last and final thing, um, we have spoken one or two times already about shutting down the LHC, uh, which sounds also trivial at first, but really is not. So um, the last thing here is uh, what we call the beam dump. So the energy content that is contained in those particle beams, uh, it can be, can be used, could be used if it were uh, shoot, shot on a, on a copper target, it could just uh, melt 1,000 kilograms or one ton of copper instantly. Um, so during beam extraction, so the process of getting the particle beam outside, out of the LHC, um, this energy needs to be dissipated somehow. And for that, this special beam dump area is constructed. Um, so there are fast kicker magnets that are used to, uh, that are able to ramp up in a really, really short amount of time of, of microseconds. Um, and then the beam is uh, carefully and uh, con in a controlled manner directed into a set of concrete blocks um, that is basically big enough to dissipate all this energy uh, when required. And uh, in the process of doing so, it also heats up to about 800 degrees Celsius. And then, of course, also needs the associated time to cool down again. Good. Um, so as you may or may not know, currently the LHC is not in operation. So LHC currently is undergoing its second long shutdown phase, or LS2. 
Um, but what we do when uh, the LHC is in operation is that we have these status dashboards that you can see here uh, that are distributed all around CERN and can be used by anyone, any passerby, um, to basically monitor what the current uh, operation mode or the, uh, the current situation of the accelerator is and can be used also to, uh, yeah, to quickly see if, if like an operator needs to come, uh, go somewhere or is needed or how the shift planning for the next shift uh, works out and so on. And on the right side, you would see what this currently looks like. Um, so basically, black screen saying uh, next beam expect expected in spring 2021. And the good thing about these status pages is that you can actually see them from your home because they are also openly available at most, as most of the stuff we do at, at CERN. Um, so if you are interested, then perhaps in a year from now or a bit, bit longer than a year, um, it would be quite, quite interesting to follow all the commissioning process of when they are trying to start the LHC backup. Um, and follow that process uh, from, from your home. Otherwise, if you now feel the urge to maybe visit CERN, pay some of the things we talked about a visit, uh, or are just generally interested, CERN offers a variety of tours free of charge. Um, so if you're interested in that, visit that website, and we would be happy to welcome you there. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Stefan and Severin, if you have questions, there are six microphones in the room. Please uh, make a cue. And uh, we start with a signal angel. Signal angel, please, yes. first question. There is said to be a master red button for shutting down the whole system in case of heavy problems. Um, how often, how often uh, did you push it yet? Master red button? The master button. Um, like a I, I shutdown do, button. To, to answer, I can not really understand you. Um, I think the question was about how often basically we use the beam dump system to baby basically get rid of the beam. Is it correct? I guess so. Oh, so yes, I guess master so. Button. I think there's a master button. There, there, the there is not only one master button. There are several <laughs> master buttons. Uh, these are switches. Uh, it calls beam, it beam interlock switch. Uh, basically, every at every operator's uh, screen, there is basically one uh, beam interlock uh, switch. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think sometimes they get rid of the beam just because, I mean, when we have LHC at full operation, as Stefan called, uh, talked about the luminosity, so what is happening that in the beginning we have a very high amount of luminosity, so many particles uh, collide uh, on each other, but uh, over time, like after 12 or 15 hours or whatever, uh, basically the luminosity, so the amount of particles which collide with each other is going down and down, so the luminosity decreases. And then um, at some point in time, basically the operators decide that they will now get rid of the actual beam, which is at inside LHC, and basically will recover the whole machine and then restart the machine again. And this is done sometimes, I don't know, every 12 hours, sometimes after 24 hours, something like that, yes. Cool. And microphone number four, I think. Uh, yes. Uh, so where's the energy coming from? So do you have your own power plant or so? <laughs> um, no, not really. Not, not really. Um, basically, we get all the power from the French grid. So we have relatively big uh, power trails coming from the French grid. So we get uh, 450 kilovolts of power there. Uh, so basically, the voltage is quite high. And then we have our own transformers on site. And I think uh, only a little bit smaller fraction of the energy is coming from the Swiss grid. So basically, we use most of the energy that's coming from the French grid. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. And microphone number one, please. Uh, hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, if I'm not wrong, you say uh, the beam can warm a block of concrete to 800 uh, Celsius. Would it be possible to use it as a weapon? <laughs> Very likely not, and CERN uh, very much condemns these actions in any form, I guess. Um, so CERN operates in a purely peaceful mission, and they would never think about using their particle beams as a weapon. And even if they could, it is probably not the most practical thing to do, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but if your, my, your uh, telephone is again hanging up, you can destroy it, right? <laughs> <laughs> and microphone number six, I think. Uh, yes, so you said you can stop in uh, nanoseconds. But just the light would go just 50, let's say 30 centimeters in a nanosecond. How will you be able to scale in this small uh, time? Ah, no, no. So what I was talking about is that these magnets that are used to extract the beam out of the LHC, 
uh, they are they have reaction times or ramp up times that are in the order of one two three microseconds so not nanoseconds but microseconds um, and really only then basically the part, uh, particles still circulate um, in worst case one uh, one full turn and are only then moving outside of the of the accelerator yeah. and microphone number one again uh, so do you have any photos of the front of the dump block? It has to look like it's got hit a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, not really. I think that's one of the only pictures we could find about uh, the beam dump system. And um, this area is, mm, I think, it's not really opened anymore. So since operation of LHC, uh, which was in basically LHC started in 2008, um, and since then the uh, beam, dump uh, beam dump system was not opened uh, again because it's completely sealed in uh, stainless steel, and uh, that's why it was not opened anymore. Cool. Uh, question from the interwebs. Regarding power supply, how do you switch or fine control the currents? Are you using classic silicone transistors, off-the-shelf IGBTs? Um, yes. <laughs> 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 yes. Uh, the system was developed at CERN, uh, and I think that's quite common at CERN that we basically develop all the technology at CERN or try to develop nearly everything at CERN. Um, but then production, for example, is uh, put into industry. And yes, these are relatively classical power converters. The interesting or like challenging part about the con power converters is really that uh, the current has to be measured quite precisely and also controlled quite precisely. So uh, there we use also DCCTs, what Stefan mentioned before. Um, but basically all this control mechanism there, that's one of the big challenges there. Cool. Uh, microphone number one again. Uh, yeah, you talked about the orbit clock that detects when the bunches uh, completed one round. How is it possible to detect which is the first bunch? <laughs> yeah, so it is, it is actually not detected, but this clock is actually something that is constructed. So we basically what we do is we count these cycles of the, of the RF cycle. Uh, maybe I can open this slide. Uh, so somewhere there is a counter that basically knows how many 40 megahertz clock cycles a full rotation takes and then at some point decides this is number one and that's also where they start counting when they inject bunches into the LHC. So there's no marker, let's say. Uh, but there is a certain structure to the beam so you could potentially do that. So for example for these longer periods where the kicker magnets need to ramp up, they have something they call the abort gap. So a number of bunches that are never filled but are always kept empty so the magnets have enough time to uh, deflect the beam when the next uh, bunch comes around. So you could probably measure that but it's much easier to do it the other way around. Microphone number four, please. Um, you said you had uh, quite uh, tight needs for the timing clock. Uh, is it tight enough that uh, speed of light was a limit with the distances between locations, or that was not a concern? No, it is a concern. So because the, I'm just distributing a cable for 27 kilometers produces uh, like just considerable run times of, of electrical signals, all the delays or all the cables uh, need to be measured precisely for their delay and then calibrated out so all the experiments get their clocks at the right time shifted, compensated for the, the light time, let's say, that it just takes to get the signal there. Yeah. And again, the interwebs. Uh, is it uh, dangerous to stand near the concrete cooling blocks? <laughs> like radioactive wise or I don't know. Um, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Not recommended. Not yes. recommended. <laughs> we have a very good um, uh, interlock system. Also the doors, all the doors have switches. So basically when one door is basically like open, then basically the whole machine will be shut down. So we have a very uh, critical and uh, safety related uh, access system at LHC. Yeah. Uh, maybe you watch Angel and Demons, um, this Hollywood movie. There we have like uh, the eye scanners are, are shown. Uh, it's a little bit, I mean, it's Hollywood, but um, mm -hmm. uh, there we have really, we have eye scanners, so iris scanners. So every time like we want to go to the tunnel, for example, then we have to let also our iris be scanned because otherwise we will not be able to go to the tunnel. So there's a very sophisticated access system to, to really go to the tunnel. So when there is operation, the whole tunnel access is completely blocked. Cool. Uh, microphone number one, please. Um, what is the exact question? Uh, the exact reason to have each experiment uh, every side? Of, I mean, so far apart on the LHC. I mean, on opposite sides. 
Um, basically, you are talking about Atlas and uh, uh, CMS. The reason for that is because when uh, these two experiments were constructed, there was a little bit of fear that uh, particles which are not strapped away uh, can basically interact with uh, the, at the two experiments, so that they really are like the most fast way, like they have the, a very big distance from each other, so there's no interaction between them. That's why we basically put them at point one and point five. No. That's the reason why. No. If I can see it correctly, microphone number five. Um, yes, hello. Yeah. Um, I've seen that you're also using uh, the CAN bus. What are you using the CAN bus for in, in CERN? Um, I know of at least one use, uh, but that is inside an experiment. So there are, as far as I know, um, investigations underway to use CAN bus to do the actual control of the detectors of one experiment. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's a use inside the accelerator itself, so apart from the experiments. Um, but perhaps if you come by afterwards, we can find one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Microphone number one. Uh, do you have any official data about how many tons of duct tape are used <laughs> in <laughs> daily operations? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> what about zip ties? Many. Yeah. Yeah. Millions, billions. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, as far as I can see, ah, the interwebs again with a question. Yes, uh, do you uh, know your monthly power bill? <laughs> no, not really. No, sorry. No, but it is, I think, a fact that the contribution of France, which is the, I mean, the main contributor in terms of energy, um, that it is part of their contribution to contribute the electricity bill, basically. Um, mm -hmm. instead of paying money to CERN, uh, that's as far as I know. Yes, and also um, we shut down LHC and the accelerator complex during like the winter time. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because electricity is more expensive during winter time in France than in summer. In this case, I can't see any other questions. I have a, a maybe stupid question. Uh, you said earlier uh, you have to focus and defocus the beam. But um, as we know, you accelerated already the particles. Why do we have to focus the beam? Um, because every time when we also like have uh, dipole magnets, then basically we bend the particles around an arc. Uh, but then they are also defocused a little bit. And also the Coulomb force is the other problem because we have equally charged particles in the bunch or in the whole beam itself. So they will by themselves will basically go out of each other. And if you would not focus it again, then basically we would lose the whole beam in the end. Ah, thank you. I don't see any questions. Internet? In this case, thank you very, very much, Stefan and Severin. Please, with a warm applause. The Large Hadron Infrastructure Talk. Mm -hmm.